for nine years. So my name is uh, Michael Eichling, I'm from the Department of Chemistry here. And uh, actually I got to know Peter when he was a postdoc at SFU, and that was about nine years ago. And before that he did his uh, undergraduate studies at the University of Münster in Germany, uh, his uh, native country. And after that he moved to uh, England, Bristol, to do a PhD. And then he came to Vancouver as a postdoc. He was a Mitex fellow or postdoc for two or three years, right? And uh, got a faculty appointment at the University of Ontario Institute of Technology, UOIT. Uh, for some time it was Canada's youngest uh, university. <laughs> I don't know whether it still is. And he's moving on from there this year to uh, Norway, the uh, Technical University of uh, Trondheim, NTNU, and I guess he will tell us in perfect uh, no, Norwegian <laughs> <laughs> what NTNU means. And so Peter is a, well, a physicist by training and uh, has uh, studied, um, has performed a lot of studies in the area of fuel cell research, theoretical studies, mathematical physical studies of, um, well, materials that are used in fuel cells uh, for um, transport and reaction, uh, membranes, catalyst layers. And he has also a strong interest in, uh, well, global social economic issues and has published a, well, gripping book about uh, resource, resource scarcity, finite resources and social econ economic issues that uh, are related to that. And I guess these are the topics that we will talk about today. And so, as we say, without further ado, <laughs> so well, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Well, this is great when we run out of chairs and have this in this <coughs> It's a good sign that people show up. Um, yeah, why well, don't I just press ahead, right? Uh, so I'm going to talk about, I, I was told that it's sort of climate change, and what the talks don't have to be necessarily about that, because there's also people from different backgrounds. So I chose, I thought, I. I figured I'd choose one topic uh, for my book, but it's so, so current, it's so important, I think, right now, as we speak, especially in Europe, <laughs> that uh, this is why uh, I chose this, and I think it's very much related at the end of the day to sustainability. No one talks about it. And in the process, you will, if you don't know already what fiat currencies are, you will learn, okay, what a fiat currency is. So. Okay. Um, so to me, um, I think the 21st century will be quite different from the 20th century in that the 20th century struggle uh, was a struggle of ideologies and should, certainly it's always related to resources also, it's obvious, right? But it was first and foremost probably a struggle of ideologies. And the 21st century I think will be different. And we have to come to terms with the fact that we live on a finite planet that 7 billion people currently are striving for um, living standards of the first world. This will be difficult to say the least, to make this happen. And I think what's happening currently is we're not, what people talk about five years, you begin to wonder after five years that's still a, we're still in temporary crisis apparently, or five years already. It's a bit like 1984, it's an ongoing war for us, it's, like it's almost over, but not there yet. So it's, it's already five years, right? People say it's just another six months and we're, the recovery is happening, it's happening for five years apparently. At some point you have to wonder whether it's a temporary phenomenon or not. I don't think it is. I think there's something great at work. Now, the four corners of the universe, well, the universe is sustainability, I'd say. Um, when we study sustainability, climate change is one aspect, most of us just look at this aspect, and that's natural resources. So it's the use of energy, soil, water, metals, you name it, right? The conversion, etc., and their use. And then it affects the climate of the process, as an example. The other three are usually left out, and they're all equally important, I think. Population growth. No one really talks about it seriously. Okay, if we were a truly smart species, we wouldn't allow for this population growth. We're not truly smart. Um, <laughs> the economy, it's, it's feedback between all of them. They're all interlinked, right? So it interlinks with the economy and the particular, particular economic system we live in or we chose to live in. And the other thing which always gets left out is the monetary system. And this is what I'm going to talk about today. But. And the bottom line will be basically, unless you change the monetary system, you change nothing. This is the key, actually. Currently, the monetary system we live in, as it turns out, the fiat currency system, is to serve debts, you have to make a debt payments, the economy has to grow. It has to. If it doesn't, 
you default. It's a one to one correspondence. And that's the problem on the final path. Something the politicians don't tell us. That's the real crisis right now, actually. Okay, so in the right corner, it's like a boxing, right? It's not the right, like the correct corner, it's the right corner. It will be right in the left corner today. In the right corner is the planet, and the left corner is the economy, if you like, mm -hmm. the monetary system. Okay, so they're basically clashing. So just to set this up, so in one corner we have the planet, and what's going on in the planet is kind of this. Uh, this is the energy consumption over the last 200 years since the Industrial Revolution started, basically. And, uh, well, what do you see? Exponential growth in all the fossil fuels. And uh, basically, we, we moved, bottom line is basically we moved to high energy density all the time. Right? So from biofuels, wood charcoal kind of thing. We moved first to, well, coal obviously, but then we moved to uh, crude oil after that, and natural gas after that. And the source became higher, it became uh, higher in energy density, and typically, typically you could say cleaner. I mean, from coal to crude oil to natural gas, you might call it clean in terms of CO2. And recently, there's a debate because now we're going to non-conventional natural gas and so on, but it's a different story. Uh, what you see, hydro is, has been growing, but it's maybe 50, people say typically 50% maxed out worldwide, say more or less. Nuclear power has stalled since uh, 70s and 80s, particularly because of the accidents we have. And I think it has stalled. There was a talk of the Renaissance. It's one of those things that's always 10 years away. It's never happened to so the Renaissance. I don't think it will ever happen. Uh, in any case, so uh, fossil fuels make up for 80% or so of the world's energy consumption. Um, and um, why do we need so much? So this is the non-politically correct slide, but I love it. I, have to bring it up. I call this the energy stage. So if you look up how much energy Canadians consume in a year, you can look up Statistics Canada. You can, it, you can convert this in yourself if you have a brain, I guess, into kilocalories per day yourself. And that means the average Canadian consumes about 150,000 kilocalories per day. That's not the food, it's a little bit much, right? That's all the stuff that powers our economy. Now, if you were to use slaves for this, I don't know why I came out 53, but make it 50. If it was 3,000 kilocalories per slave per day, uh, you need 50 slaves. Uh, in fact, the slave wouldn't really do 3,000 kilocalories. You feed him probably 3,000, but he probably already come up maybe 1,000 calories, right, in terms of actual work. So it's probably 150 slaves or something. <laughs> so our lifestyle right here, every one of you on average, we have about 150 slaves behind you doing all the work for you. If this was manual labor. So probably, probably it's 100 to fly a plane, to all paddle for you, right, that kind of thing. So the food, the consumption, the flying, the transportation, the home heating, the whole thing, if it was done, that, that amount of joules being used every year for you, uh, if this was done by manual labor, you can't really do it that way, obviously, that easily. But it corresponds to the output of about 100 slaves. This is stunning, right? This is actually stunning. If you look at these old movies from the South, and you get worked up, or well, how could they possibly enslave 20 people on a farm? Well, you have 150 behind you. But of course, the virtual slaves are not the same. It's basically fossil fuels. So this is a massive scale, especially if everyone wants to live like us, right? And I don't think we can continue to live the way we live uh, on this planet and expect that we meet sustainability one day. So um, what we're doing for now is we're getting very desperate. So somehow we're beginning to clash with the, with the limits of the planet. And where do you see this? Well, you see it in many ways. So we're trying to keep this going here, with 100 some slaves or so, and it's getting more and more difficult. So as a Canadian, you're very aware of this. This is like straight in the bottom. So we're getting very desperate now, right? Kitchen sink, I say, we're throwing everything. So for now we think to keep the 150 sales going for every Canadian and other people on this planet, tar sands, right? Okay, conventional oil is beginning to deplete, especially the high quality oil. So we're moving towards non-conventional resources like tar sands. This is probably a good thing if you can't see this picture because there's a reflection on the outside, it was very depressing. <laughs> so this is like a moon landscape, obviously. Uh, but you can look at other things like shale gas and coal bed methane, and this is a <coughs> aerial photograph of, I think it's Colorado, Wyoming, I always forget which one's which. But it's gas extraction, it's one or the other, anyways. And uh, you see here that the well, these are wells sort of scattered across the landscape, and then all the roads being built for the wells. The wells only last two to three years, right, each well. And they're probably only a few hundred meters apart. So you have several wells per, it's about 10 or 20 wells per hectare to do this. And then it lasts for two or three years and then you bend the whole thing. And then you change the nature and the process obviously. So when they tell you the natural gas is clean, that's going to be a whole different debate when you actually look at such satellite photos, right? 
and then never mind proof on the ground board, etc. It's another story. So the, the point is that it gets very intrusive now, so to keep the circus going, to keep that many million barrels per day uh, flowing and so many cubic feet of natural gas gets more and more difficult. Okay. So then you can ask the scientist, I'm a physicist, right, of training, so you can ask the physicist, what else should we do? It's this debate, of course. So you don't like catastrophes, you don't like cold methane, and you don't like non-conventional gas. What else can we do? And this is a very good question, actually. And when you ask a physicist, then you might get a different answer from when you ask maybe an engineer or so. And as a physicist, what I find interesting is this thing called energy return investment. And basically what it is, you have an energy supply system like the task lens. And then you can ask yourself, for every joule of energy I put into the system to run whatever I'm running, pumps and you, know, you name it, the rigs, I can get the oil out, then I have to refine the course and so on and so forth. For every joule I put into the system, how many joules of crude oil do I actually get out of the task then? So that's a ratio of the two. And you call this, some people call this energy return investment. So put a joule in, how much get I, do I get out? If I get less than one joule out, I might as well not do it. Energetically, it's not worth it, right? You spend more than you get out. So, as a physicist, you would say, at the end of the day, this is just entropy, basically. Stone dynamics, you can work this out in principle. Um, and people have done this for several systems. And the global system, it's hard to estimate, but people estimate that it's about 50 to 1. So you spend right now on the planet about a joule to extract energy somehow from the planet, and you get about 15 joules out of it. That's pretty good. It's not bad. Um, but I'm going to show, show you what you typically find. So uh, this is this ratio, right? So at 1 to 1, you break even. So it's this line, basically. And then uh, crude oil from the Middle East, well, it's a bit unknown, but it's, it's sometimes like Saudi Arabia in the early days of like 100 to 1 or something. And it's still quite high anyways. Um, if you go to US crude oil, because they're going offshore, for instance, right? Um, it's much more energy intense to go offshore and extract oil and so on and so forth. So the US crude oil on average is maybe between it's around 10 to 1. So that's it. Tar sands, well, here it's a bit low, perhaps. Maybe just 2 to 1 or so. There's a lot of papers about it. Most of them range between 4 to 1 and 7 to 1. Okay. I can remember the global average is 50 to 1. Wind is pretty good. Uh, most studies are above 20 to 1. Um, that's cold to liquid, diesel. So that's how the Germans fought the war, right? And they took coal and they liquid fuel out of it and, and trying to you know, take over the world. So that's somewhere around, who knows, 10 to 1 or so. It's not that bad actually, but it's a bit misleading because it's still in. Uh, uh, it creates a lot of CO2 emissions, for instance, it could become a bit required a lot of water. Solar PV, you see different studies, typically somewhere about 10 to 1, not so bad. And then basically all biofuels are low. Uh, bioethanol, corn based ethanol is somewhere around 1 to 1. It might be 1.2 to 1 or something, but it's not 15 to 1, you see. So if you want to run this world as it is now, continue to run it, you probably need something of this water to run it. Okay? 1 to 1 or 2 to 1 or 1 to do this, okay? Uh, and to do this, well, right off the bat, as a physicist, you would say, don't even bother with biofuels. Don't even try. That's way too low. Of course, once you can maybe boost it to 10 to 1 is a different story, but I'm not sure this will ever happen. So as a physicist, you would say, well, we should only pursue technologies with a high energy return investment. Okay? The problem is coal. Uh, is it actually on this list? It's not even on this list, is it? So coal is typically, most people think it's about 20 to 1. Depends on what coal, what grade, and what mine, and so on and so forth. But rule of thumb is about 20 to 1. It's very good, unfortunately, energetically. So this doesn't speak to pollution necessarily, right? It's in CO2 emissions. So uh, coal is cheap too. And uh, so for the Chinese to build one coal fired power plant every week or so, energetically it makes sense. Economically it makes sense. So probably won't change anytime soon. That's the thing to do. Unfortunately. And then when you look at each, um, I'm just saying it's not just the, it's non equilibrium thermodynamics. So if you run an energy system at a finite rate, you have a finite energy throughput through a system, you lose some energy, the useful energy in the process. And um, the way this shows in these different technologies is basically as a rule of thumb, you might say, the lower the energy return investment, the higher the pollution. That's a rule of thumb. So within oil, say, if you stick to oil, Take an oil in Saudi Arabia, right? It's maybe 50 to 1. And you take a tar sand, it's 4 to 1. Rule of thumb will tell you lower energy return investment will be high pollution. It works really well throughout the, all the technologies. So we picked a different 
as fossils on the planet. So you can do the same for natural gas, um, uh, what else? Coal and so on and so forth. So the, if you have, if you stick to oil and you want to stick to it, as your energy return investment begins to drop, the pollution will, pollution will go up. That's the rule of thumb, basically. It's really hard to quantify in particular in, in, uh, specifically, but so that's how it works. Well, uh, if you had oil from a particular source and coal, let's say 20 to 1, how would that compare? Yeah, that's not easy to compare. Mm. So it's just within every given technology. Yeah. Um, okay. So now, very quickly, because before then, switch over to the left corner. <coughs> this is something interesting as a physicist, and, and uh, some of you, I don't know if you all study, but um, some of you have heard about these concepts, I'm sure. So, if you, have, if you want to run this planet the way it is, with all the complex features we have, you name them, right? All the complexities we have. They're very involved, very specialized, and so on, very complex. And then, what is complexity in general? So you might say, well, somehow it's, it's given by the level of intricacies of patterns or pattern formation within a system and its connections and so on and so forth. You can kind of specify or quantify what complexity is. In physics, what you often find complexity is, this is what it's actually called, if you have a system that's driven, that means you put energy into the system. That means it's driven. It's dis dissipative, so the, the system will then take that energy and dissipates in some form or another. And the system has some nonlinear features. Okay, so there's no linear response to what you put in, there will be nonlinear response. Then what you often find in physics is pattern formation. Not always, but you can get pattern formation. There's a million examples for that nature. Okay, whether it's the leopard and the skin of the leopard and you know, stripes on it, it's a pattern and, and you can often describe it this way. And if you look at this in out there, often I think of the society and economy and its pattern formation, right? There's all these patterns out there that we develop, develop these the complexities we develop. It needs energy to do that. You need a certain energy throughput to have these patterns. That's what you find in these physical systems. And to me, our society, bottom line is basically the same thing. You have to have a certain energy throughput to get certain complexities. Okay, when you think of it that way, you can think of the Industrial Revolution, for instance, it was just basically farming before, very little manufacturing, and once you had the critical energy throughput of society, which was coal in England at the time, if you boosted that throughput, at some point you could develop complex patterns. Um, and then, for instance, economics, so uh, we can also include in the infrastructure things like uh, the IT world and so on and so forth. Well, these are all the complexities we built. And then the question, well, the, the first of all, what you have to do then is you need a certain energy throughput, a constant one, just to stay steady, because you have to maintain things. Our world is dissipative, so that means if you don't maintain the roads, they just fall apart, right? Okay. And so you have to keep feeding the system energy, our society energy, just to maintain the complexities, never mind grow them. This is rather amazing. Now what can happen then is, um, this might not be a linear process, that means I could all of a sudden develop new complexities if I increase my energy flow. It could be a discontinuous process, like industrial revolution. We increase the energy throughput to a certain threshold, and once you pass the threshold, you get new complexities. Unfortunately, you can have the thing, same in reverse. As a society collapses, which has happened many times over the history of mankind, lots of civilizations have collapsed. And the question is always, at what point does it collapse and what does collapse mean? You could measure in terms of complexities that it becomes much, much simpler society. And maybe this happens very rapidly. And maybe this happens when the energy flow in this case drops you so with a certain value. Now people are trying to estimate these things. No one knows, of course. <laughs> I can tell you that this society as we have it now could not be run on an energy return investment of 2 to 1. It would be insanity. Like every single one of you would just be digging out coal or gas or uranium. All of us wouldn't be in this room right now. Because every single one of us would just be involved in making energy available. And then there's no one to listen to lectures anymore, you see? Or the TV or something. Do you know what I mean? There's two of us, there's so much overhead. If you go to 2 to 1 or 1.2 to 1, if you all this just corn based ethanol, then all of us will almost be employed in the convex ethanol industry, and then uh, who's painting a picture of you to look at the art gallery? There's no one left. You see, that when at some point it drops, um, the complexity begins to crash, and, and the question is when no one knows, of course. I mean, there are people that are trying to seriously estimate this, but I think these papers are not so scientific. It's really hard to do this. The best guesses are somewhere from studying civilizations that collapsed, and somewhere around 5 to 7 to 1. So, if that was the case, the thousands are too low. My thousands are 4 to 1 maybe, 5 to 1, if the whole world ran on non-commercial fossil fuels, then this society couldn't exist as it is. Never mind pollution, 
We're not talking about pollution here, you see? We're just talking about complexity. So that's interesting. Um, okay, now the connection. Uh, so the planet has some trouble, right? So it's not just, it's just not oil or energy. So if you look at this century, then perhaps we might see production peaks of these or the availability of these in this century in the following order. The first thing to probably peak is probably oil. I mean, I think that's a safe bet. Uh, followed by coal, if you look at most studies anyways, and then natural gas later on, and maybe uranium eventually. And then fresh water might have already peaked, I don't know, I'm an expert on that. Topsoil. If you look at the United Nations, at the, sorry, at the IPC climate change studies and scenarios, topsoil, believe it or not, is one of, in the scenarios, you look at the scenarios, forecasting topsoil, so that means arable land, that's where you know this total hectares and arable land on the planet, is an ingredient of the scenarios, believe it or not. It's really interesting. When you dig down into all the databases and stuff, you find arable land. And in most scenarios, topsoil, or it's called arable land, if you like, is, uh, is peaking this century. So in these IPCC scenarios. Very interesting. Feeds back into the population, of course. So we have a problem, right? So we're going to we seem to be peaking all kinds of things this century. That's probably fair to say, most of these, if not all. And uh, then comes the big task to still not collapse as a society, of course. Right? Uh, depending whether the population is another story. So we have to get through this somehow. Okay, now here's the connection. So I think we could potentially get through this with a lot of smart people, maybe population control and whatnot. But there's one thing, I think, that prevents us from doing it at the end of the day. And that's something none ever talks about. That's the left corner of the two guys in the ring, and that's the fiat money and fractional reserve banking. And that's what the world's based on. I'm going to tell you quickly what it is now. And hopefully can convince you there's a real problem here. Yeah. Okay. Money. So, uh, why does the monetary system, why is it clashing with the finite planet? So that's sort of the topic of today's talk, right? But well, first of all, you have to ask yourself what money actually is, and why do you need money? And it's just very interesting when you just ask someone why you need money. It really takes you some time to figure this out, why you need money. It's very practical, actually, the explanation is very practical. To facilitate trade, of course. You see, if there was no money, the only thing you can trade is bartering. I make a product, I have a service, you have a service, and we trade directly. Okay, no money is needed. But if you have three parties, and each party is only interested in the other party's product, right, like a circle, you need money to do it. You need money to facilitate the goods. Or if you have an empire, like the British Empire, you have some colonies in India, which are like a few months of sailing away from you, from, from London, and you know, you want to sort of bring a good there, but you don't have anyone to barter right in India, you want to bring something back with which you then can some, acquire something in England, but it takes you maybe six months for the round trip. Who can guarantee you that you will actually get something in return as the Queen of England, of course, or the King of England would have said, you know, this thing here, with my signature on it, or my stamp, guarantees you a certain value, because I say so because I'm the King of the Queen. That's money, basically. So without this, no trade. That's the bottom line. So money is really only there to trade. That's the, that's the first and foremost um, property of money, of task of money. Now, the kicker the, the, the is this, right? If you can't guarantee the money's value, how do you conduct, them, conduct trade? And I'll come back to that today. Okay. Now it gets more.